has resulted in a manifest educational hardship. And welcome to prime sponsor, Representative Flagg. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and members of the Education Committee. For the record, my name is Mr. Flagg. I represent the town of Haverhill. And I'm here today to introduce HB 1492. When we discuss 1492, we're going to be talking about terms like education, manifest educational hardship. And when I first looked at this, I was trying to find a definition for that, and I couldn't find it other than in law, or in, not law, but in a court case that came out of the town of Lisbon, Lisbon Regional, back in 1974, which was heard in the Supreme Court. And the decision identified three key points from that decision. An education, a manifest educational hardship is, one, a substantial portion of a child's academic, physical, personal, and social needs cannot be met by the assigned school and not found with the student body of the assigned school. Two, the attendance at the assigned school will impair the educational progress of the child. And three, another public school or public academy, either within the district or in another district, may reasonably meet the child's educational needs. <coughs> so that is uh, basically what this, this um, uh, <clears throat> bill is all about, the manifest educational hardship. Now what I've done in this bill, and I just walked to the very last page, page four, you can see a definition which incorporates some of that, but it also has, it reads in this section, manifest educational hardship means the difficulty as well as the deprivation arising not only from the problems of access to the school originally assigned, but also those matters not in the best interest of the child that adversely affect the child's physical or mental condition. So it's sort of kind of a synopsis of what was stated by the judge in that particular case. The second part of this, of this bill, in the definition area, or at the end of the bill, it says, a level one or a level two school that shows no academic achievement and grows for two consecutive years shall be deemed a failing school by the department and not the best interest of the child and therefore subject to provisions of this chapter. So that's the other area which is, there's two directions this is going in, in terms of a student being able to be placed by the school district in another public school. The, in discussing that last one where we talk level one and level two, this is all contingent upon what comes out of the ESSA discussions next week. That is where we're looking at two consecutive years of the school being a level one or a level two. I don't think the word failing is the proper word here, that not providing an opportunity for the adequate education. I think that needs to be worked and probably will be worked up when we talk about ESSA. The primary reason for <coughs> submitting this is that there has been some discussion at the state board level regarding these hearings and why uh, a parent has requested the child be placed in another educational setting. Usually we have considered, as we have other education choice bills, a student generally will become wanting to apparently request because the school is either not providing the academic program that they feel the child should receive or there's a situation of bullying going on where the child's under tremendous emotional stress or there's some other kind of disciplinary <coughs> issue going. Uh, it could have to do with physical capabilities of the child. It could be all kinds of different rationale. Where's the onus, though, for determining this, this, this type of a program, the manifestation <coughs> of hardship? Where, where is that decided? With the school board. With the school board. Now, what this bill tries to do, it states that the parent, the superintendent, the psychologist or a medical doctor can present why to the school board why this child needs another option. Now there are options specified within this bill and it's not just 
put the kid in another public school or outside the school district in another public school. We added in on page three or two, two other ways, two other considerations <coughs> On line 31 and 32, to another classroom or placement within the school, I know that that is currently being done. That if there's a child having a, a difficult time, you don't like to do it as a school principal, but you sometimes you have to do it for numerous, for certain reasons, or in the best interest of the child. Or, or on line 32, propose another action that may offer relief. So it gives the school board a lot of parameter in terms of what they can do, they, they may say that this child needs more support from an agency like Community Mental Health or something such that or refer to special services or some other program. So what we're trying, to, I'm trying to do within this bill and the co-sponsors as well, having the parent come in and not having the parent be put in a position where they have to prove something, they're presenting and they are saying to the school board, now you act upon our recommendation and consider that recommendation. It's not where the recommendation has to be from the superintendent to the school board that way. It's opening up the door for other professional and the parent professionals and the parent to offer that. The, the bill establishes an, an evidentiary standard for establishing the manifest educational hardship by putting that, trying to define that at the base of the bill I went through, or what that is, so three categories. Um, it shifts the burden of proof from the parents to the school board. <coughs> so the school board now has the burden of proving what the parent is presenting to that school board. It kind of reverses it. That's the intent of the bill. And there's a question that was asked by the commissioner at one of the hearings, and his question was, given that the board's responsibility is about relief, what were the options that the board considered to relieve this manifest educational hardship? So there, I think that has to be done in, in a closed session with a parent, and be looking thoroughly at all the options and listening to what, if I had a medical doctor come to me and my child was having a difficult time, said it's related to the educational setting for one reason or another. I would want my child out of that educational setting and placed somewhere else. But it does not necessarily mean to another school. It could be somewhere else within that school, possibly some of those other options. So, Basically, this bill is being presented because it does it is not meant to be a school choice bill. It's meant to be a bill that provides options for a child who is having a difficult time and trying to find the best fit for that child within the public school system or systems that we have available. Uh, please take any questions. So I have a question for you. So Based on what you just said and taking a look at it, it's up to the school board. So if a student has just doesn't like a teacher, the school board can say that doesn't fall into this category. That doesn't. Fit. They still have the discretion to say this does not apply. Is is that a correct interpretation? It's my understanding. I mean, my my thinking that there's got to be a lot more than I just don't like the teacher. You know, there are a lot of teachers I didn't like that taught me an awful lot. And maybe they taught me a little tolerance. Uh, so I, I would think that that would not be one, but it would be up to the school board working with, in consultation with the superintendent and the principals to come up with a plan to help this child. If it goes to that degree, I would expect something that simple not to go to this type of a hearing. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for taking the question. So, clarify for me. If the, if the resolution, as you say here, is that it's now the, the responsibility of the school board to seek the appropriate relief for the issue, and if the school board comes up with the relief that they think is best, and the parent does not agree with that, 
times as the time does it get dispersed? Well, there is an appeal process in law right now where it can go to the state board. So why do we need this if there's already an appeal process to go to the state board? My interest in putting the definition in on the bottom of it, I think we need to really define what we, we're doing That's here. The last page you're referring to? Yeah, that came out of the uh, court decision. I think that that's, that's important. I think also that there are schools which are not providing and meeting the academic needs of a particular student in terms of academics. We know that happens uh, for some students where there's no AP courses offered. We've had that testimony in other committees that they don't have the wherewithal for the AP. Maybe that student belongs next door where AP courses or IB courses are offered. Would that be a reason for going to another school? I would think so, because the student deserves to have that opportunity that others are receiving in the state. The equity gap is getting greater in this state. And in order to provide what a child needs, we need to have options. And this is one of those options for placement in another public school. So if I may follow, follow up, up yes. on that point. So let's take, let's take the, uh, the AP as an example. What would happen then? Let's say I'm going to, uh, into Pittsfield, for example, right now, and the superintendent has testified before this committee that they don't have any AP courses. And my child, obviously, uh, is a, a academically uh, such that he'd like to have an AP course. He doesn't have it, I want him to have it. So what would be the resolution? Well, the resolution of that would be, I would think that the superintendent in, in Pittsfield would then contact next door, maybe where we heard the other superintendent, you were there and heard it as well, would say, okay, can we tuition this student over there for this course or that course? And, and meet this child's needs that way. The school board would have to agree, though, to be paying for those costs. Isn't it um, true that up to this point, this particular <coughs> manifest um, change of, of districts or of schools has only happened very rarely and in extreme cases? very difficult process. It is a very difficult <coughs> process. You have to look at definitions. What is this, this so-called manifest educational hardship? What's the definition of that? What's the criteria for? Um, and there have been several cases of, of late which have gone to the State Board of Education. Um, I don't have them in front of me here, but they have been. And I don't know what the resolution was to those. I just would like to see that the person that knows the child best is really the parent. And putting the parent in a defensive mode, I think, is, is wrong. Thank you. Thank you for taking my question. As we know, serving on this commission to study school funding, our only obligation and our only responsibility is to provide, ensure that we have each school provide an adequate education as defined by the standards, etc., that we have come up with. And therefore, no school is required to provide anything more than that adequate education. An AP class is not part of what we define as an adequate education. So, I am. So, would you explain to me if that's the case, which I've stated fact here? why it would be a manifest hardship if a child can't get something from what we define as an adequate education beyond that adequate education. I, I would miss the first class. The, the school which we talked about which didn't have the AP, and if we also believe in competency education, competency-based education. The student moves along at a different rate than the students maybe in that other school. We've also talked about gifted programs. What happens if there's no, nothing there for that student in that particular school? Other schools may offer that. And the equity gap within our state here is, is growing. Even with concurrent and dual enrollment, it's growing. 
you may not have a person qualified or recognized by a community college to teach a course in your school, so you can't offer that except by way of B-Labs. <coughs> Whereas the school next door may have a master's level math teacher that can provide that, who's accepted by the accreditation standard at the, the college level. Shouldn't the student that is in the school which doesn't have the abil ability to pay for that and offer that, and the child's ready for it, have the opportunity to experience that in a school that does provide it, and it may be just right next door. If it's a question, not a debate. <laughs> okay. No, no, that was a question, but no, I don't know. Yeah. Then, or if we are to presume more than that, obviously, which we all of these other things. And had we better not increase that 3600, which is what we did to supply for an adequate education, then how can we not say now we need 12,000, 14,000 from our state? In a small district, you can keep increasing that amount and base adequacy from 3636 to $5,000. And if you only enroll, 67 kids in that school, you're not going to be able to provide that. You're not going to have the students to participate in that particular class, whereas the district may, next door may have the numbers. Our whole funding formula is based upon per capita. So there are going to be those issues which just prevent a school district from offering it, and you can throw more money at them. You're going to have to throw huge sums, and you're going to have to revise the whole adequacy formula if you're going to do that. Secondly, I think that this state likes to use this word adequate education. Very subjective term. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can you clarify? There seems to be a disconnect between one and eight. And that in one, the school board may recommend a reassign and so forth. But in eight, it looks like it's already been predetermined that a level one and level two school is to the evidence that the institution I, I, Where are you? I'm in the page uh, Roman number one of the bill where it describes <coughs> one one or one. It describes what the school board has to do. They yes. have to turn to this. They shall consider and, and recommend a course of action. And they could put the, and then it gives what course of actions are available to them. But in section eight, it says essentially in the last sentence that if it's already a level one or level two school, that's why you even go through the process with the superintendent because that's being in one of those schools is already deemed <coughs> to be, might be in the best interest of the child. What choices does that school board have? if they were already in level one or two school. Representative Burton, I referenced that part, and that needs a lot of clarification, that last sentence. That was written when these bills were put together with the ESSA. I would, myself, not support part the way it's written here in those last three lines. I think that needs you know, four lines. It needs to be looked at. I do very much support lines 28 through 31. Uh, however, this part right here, um, I think there is some truth to the fact that if, if a, a school is not meeting the bar in a particular subject area, and this is a strength suit and the school can't provide proper instruction for that student, the student should have that. Uh, that is a, an issue which we need to address somehow so the student has the opportunity to receive the academic instruction that child needs or requires. So just to clarify this, you're talking about on page four. Yes. You're saying lines 31 to 34 still need some clarification. That was really an afterthought <laughs> to this bill, uh, which you know was put in there. I'm not in love with it. Uh, I am prim primarily concerned with getting a proper definition in there. What is a manifest educational hardship, which we don't have. <coughs> Um, thank you. Uh, so, so um, 
in this case, it, as far as I understood, uh, man's best hardship was that the sending school is then responsible for the tuition costs. And if a student from, let's say, a school that um, is not doing well uh, or doesn't have an AP course and um, has a per student cost of, let's say, $15,000, uh, the parent wants to send the school to a local school that, like, Sunapee has $23,000 per student average cost. Does that mean that the sending school has to has to provide that extra money and, and pay the full cost? Mm, no, not the way this, the school board makes that decision as to where they're sent. And obviously, if they don't have the money, that's not an option. But they have to look at some form of relief to assist the student with the issues that they're dealing with. And this is only for those which have that, that degree of a hardship. Uh, taking a, a school that's $23,000 for tuition from a school district that's 14 or 15, I, I don't think that's a viable option in this case. Maybe for if there's special services, yes. Also, in regard to your definition in lines 28 through 31, in, uh, um, what is the IEP team the one that determines the uh, degree of mental or physical distress that the student is experiencing, or is there <coughs> any kind of professional authority that provides backup to support yeah. the uh, definition? That was the <coughs> purpose and the intent initially to say that it's a recommendation to the board from a psychologist or a medical doctor. Parents also in there, however, the parent would not have that degree of understanding the medical doctor unless the parent is a medical doctor. Or a psychologist, which is also uh, <coughs> has a, a background in determining that. Uh, so that's an area that uh, you may want to look at. Uh, I think it's important that the recommendation come from a person that has the knowledge and understanding how to discern what a hardship such as this, the degree of the hardship. I think a medical person would, a psychologist would, another principal or educator may. And of course the parent is in there simply because the parent does know the child and is able to look at that history and see there's something wrong and uh, we need to address that. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Thank you for taking my question. To, su to some families, music or sports does constitute in their minds an integral part of the of their child's education so in a some smaller schools don't have music programs or, or say to some family playing hockey is like a they see it as an integral part of their child their child's future in terms of potential scholarship so anyway my question is uh would when that argument is made by some parents that their child needs a, a to be able to be in a music program or a hockey program, would that would this statute cover that argument? Well, if you look at what an adequate education is on 193E and look at it, you're not going to see hockey identified. Uh, you're going to see some basic core areas. Uh, so, um, but I know there are. You know, I was I was a grandfather of a child that you know we put in another school simply because she was talented, is talented in indoor and outdoor track. And the school that she was in didn't have it. It resulted in that scholarship, annual scholarship, of 40 grand a year. Uh, so it was a good move on the part of grandpa, but it's something that I don't believe would qualify as a hardship scene. We're not talking about co curricular activities, we're talking about curricular activities and social activities within the school, within the school day. Um, bullying is certainly not curricular, but that's certainly a social health issue. Thank you. Representative P. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, for taking my question. Madam Chair, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> this bill appears to have significant financial implications for a local school district. Why is there not a fiscal note attached to this bill? 
it is basically that the, this education hardship is part of law, as you know, already. And schools are have done this. So right now, in the past, it's been on the school to identify that program and to pay for that program. I would see it continuing. Speaking, thank you. Thank you for taking my follow-up question. Speaking for constituents in the city in which I live, my fear is that this, the costs related to multiple placements of students in other school districts could have an Im a significant impact on our local property taxes. Could you speak to that at all? The decision has to be made by your local school board. They have options to offer other relief. It's not necessarily always placement in another school. It may be internal services or programs offered to the child at school. It may be that they thought they took care of the bullying situation. They did take care of it. They did the discipline. But the bullying continues offline or off school grounds or, or online somewhere or on the play yard or in the halls. And it's not seen by the, by the, the teacher. That does occur. That does occur. So how do you address that and the students at the point where they can't function? And that does occur. I know of several situations up my way where parents had to take the child out to another school and pay for it themselves. A very, very small school. Like, we have six more pink cards. Very quick clarification. Um, line 29 seems to say that the losing school district board could not approve whatever arrangement is made. Which page are you on? On page 2. It says that the agreement of the superintendent receiving school administrative unit and the approval of the school boards of each school district which include the sending district, would have to approve it. So that does give the losing school district another shot at agreeing to whatever their plan is. To put a child in another school district or another school that's outside your district, that's subject to the, the receiving school accepting and having room for that student. And it also seems to say... And the agreements are made between the has, two. But the city district has to agree also. Yes. So that's the district the child's coming from. The city who, who doesn't agree it goes back to the drawing board? Well, it wouldn't occur. The sending district is the district where the student is enrolled currently. That portion is already locked. Do we go and test the ball? All right, thank you. I'm going to be gone for an hour here. So, um, for our next presenter, I can't quite read the handwriting. Is it Daniel? Somebody from SAU18? That's me, yeah. Daniel Legal. So, you're not an English teacher? I am not an English teacher. Former math teacher. <laughs> okay, there you go. Can you spell your last name? I sure can. Capital L E, capital G, J L L O. Oh. Thank you. For the record, my name is Dan Legallo, and I am the superintendent of the schools for the Franklin School District. Uh, I just wanted to talk very briefly about the financial implications that we're concerned about in Franklin. Should we still move forward? Uh, if 1% of the students in our district were able to prove benefit, manifest educational hardship, we'd be talking about 10 kids because we have about 1,000 students in our district. At $15,000 a student, that's about $150,000 that we need to either raise or cut from our budget. $150,000 in our, in our district is about three teaching positions. Um, we struggle already with the loss of stabilization and our reduction in adequacy. 
and I just see this as another piece that we would have to deal with financially that would put a hardship on the district. So I appreciate the time. Thank you so much. Can you take any questions? I will take questions. Are there any representative Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll be quick. The suggestion has been made that the law is already in place, and yet there is, in this case, the idea that the school board has to prove its position. Can you, from your position, quickly discuss the, the existing law as compared to this? Because to me, this seems quite a bit different than what we have already. Yes, I mean, I haven't been, I haven't had a manifest educational hardship issue in my district. I've been a superintendent for three years. So I haven't looked up at the current situation and what the current policies are. Um, like I said, my concerns were purely financial, not in terms of what the process was to make those decisions for parents. Anyone? Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, next I'd like to invite our Christina from the School Boards Association. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, members of the committee. Uh, for the record, Bear, Christina, and the Hampshire School Board Association. <clears throat> we uh, oppose House Bill 1492. Uh, I appreciate Representative Ladd's comments. Um, if the committee will indulge me for a few minutes. I'd like to give a little historical background as to manifest educational hardship. Um, uh, when, uh, when it was announced that Department of Education Rule 8320 was going to be up for revision last fall, um, I anticipated the bill let this <coughs> forward. Um, so I did a significant amount of legislative research and background um, in looking at sort of what manifest educational hardship is, why it was developed. I read the, the case that, um, that uh, Representative uh, Ladd uh, mentioned in the land gap and with school districts. I think we need to put that case in context. That case was decided by the New Hampshire Supreme Court in, I believe, 1974. The educational landscape in New Hampshire was significantly different back in 1974 than it was now. The primary aspects relative to manifest education <coughs> hardship related to transportation up north, small districts that, you know, you might live on one town, but based on the border, you might be 10 or 15 miles or 20 miles from your high school, but right over the border, there's another one three or four miles away. It was a transportation issue. The other thing we need to remember, that back in 1974, there was no special education. So school districts didn't have special education programs, and they didn't have facilities, and they didn't have needs and services to meet the needs of these children. Some, some, some schools would. So if a public school had, a, had a, 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 a program for children with disabilities, prior to federal law requiring that schools have this, the kids might, be, might go to that district to um, to, uh, to, to, to receive the special education services. What I think is most compelling, though, um, is that if we're going to talk about the law and what it is and how it works, we have 170,000, more than that, 175,000 students in public schools. The Department of Education hears one, maybe two, maybe three manifest educational hardship appeals every year. I think that's indicative, and the people behind me that I know are registered to speak will talk about this better than I can. I think it's indicative that in most cases, the situation gets resolved at the local level under <coughs> current law, under current Department of Education rules, under collaboration between school boards, collaboration between superintendents, collaboration between principals. There was very compelling testimony um, at the State Board of Education, I forget if it was the the October and November meeting when ED320 was being opened back up. There was an attorney representing parents, there was an attorney representing school districts. They testified together and said, when we get these situations, we get on the phone and we talk about it, and the parents talk to the principal, and the principal was involved with the attorneys representing the parties, and we find reasonable solutions for children under existing law. We work what's in the best interest of children under the existing law. I think the um, I, I think the changes that that, that are, are presented are overly broad. I don't think they're necessary to be quite frank. Um, and I think um, talking to the bill itself, Representative Ladd talked about shifting the burden, where parents' allegations or, 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 or claims are, are are taken to be true, if you will, and the school board has to then defend itself. 
Um, I'm not aware of any other process in American law where the person making the claim, the plaintiff, if you will, doesn't have some sort of initial burden that they need to prove. Um, if the parents are going to claim that, 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 that there's a manifest educational hardship, I think it's reasonable that they present evidence to do so. And the language in the bill about providing a doctor's notes and things of that nature, you're already allowed to do that. <clears throat> you have a hearing before this, your local school board, you have an appeal to the, to the State Board of Education. That's what those are. That's where this, where this testimony and evidence comes in. Doctor's notes and report cards and psychological reports, guidance counselors, things of that nature. Um, NHSBA does share uh, the concerns that have been raised relative to the, the financial and fiscal impact local school districts that will have to have to endure if we broaden the scope of manifest educational hardship. Um, one other tidbit from the Landaff um, case that Representative Ladd mentioned, that case went to litigation because the local, the, the handful of students were reassigned by the State Board of Education and said, you have to pay the tuition to this school district. The voters never appropriated that. They had a separate warrant articles specifically <coughs> for paying tuition to that other school district and the voters didn't approve that. Um, which I think is just a unique, um, complex twist to this whole process about how is this money going to be raised, how is this money going to be allocated, what obligation does the school district have um, to pay tuition to a, 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 a neighboring school district if that reassignment is made by the State Board of Education rather than determined locally, um, which I think sort of brings us back around when we're talking about tuition payments and going back and forth. And again, again, the superintendents and school board members can speak more cogently to that, but it's my understanding that those are informal conversations by the superintendents. You take this child of mine, I'll take that child of yours, and we'll call it a wash on the tuition. Um, but anyway, um, I think that some of my testimony is that the current practice works, works fine. Um, there are very few cases that come to the State Board of Education. We never hear about the cases that get resolved locally, right? Those don't make the news, those don't make the headlines. But we know every day, um, <clears throat> parent rights advocates and parents and students and school board members and administrators are working for the best interests of students to find these sorts of alternative programs or alternative educational opportunities. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Are there any questions? Yeah. See, you did such a great job. <laughs> <laughs> you can check the bill right now. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I would like to welcome Lisa White. Good afternoon, thank you uh, for uh, allowing me to speak. My name is Lisa Witt, and I'm the superintendent in the Monadnock Regional School District. Down in the southwest corner of the state, uh, we serve the towns of Fitzwilliam, Gilson, Richmond, Roxbury, Swansea, and Detroit. I did bring a testimony that I believe is making its way around the room, and I just would like to talk with you about what the process looks like from the, from the superintendent school board um, level uh, under the current law. Um, in the past three years, I've had many conversations with parents and students um, about concerns or issues or struggles um, that their children are having in schools. And we've worked together with teachers, with principals, with IEP teams, with whatever we need, uh, with, with the majority of those conversations to resolve whatever the issue is, to overcome whatever the obstacle is, um, and ensure that their children are able to access and succeed uh, you know, in our district. And you know, that doesn't just benefit those students. This is part of the, the growth process and that, and that you know, constant improvement uh, process that we need to have those conversations with people. We need to find out what's happening. Um, that's how we make sure that we, are, that we are doing all that we can for all of our students. Um, in the three, past three years, I've had three uh, actual manifest education hearings before my school board, um, two of which were granted. Uh, and they were, both of them were um, extreme cases of, of bullying uh, that predominantly happened outside of the school. Um, and that just prevented those particular students from being able to access their education in the school setting. Um, it was much broader than anything related specifically um, to the school. The, the third case um, did appeal to the State Board of Education um, and the State Board upheld the school, or local school board's decision on that. So it is very rare. Um, I, it's been three, I've had two were the first year and one was the second year. Um, from a financial standpoint, it's not just the tuition, the base tuition rate. Um, special education costs are also uh, uh, need to be provided by the sending district. So 
if we had 1% of our student population in Monadnock uh, take advantage or you know, be granted a hardship transfer request, uh, that would equate to 17 students or about $260,000, give or take. And that's uh, assuming none of those students have IEPs. And different districts handle the tuition uh, for students with IEPs in different ways. Sometimes it's a different tuition rate altogether. Um, sometimes it's a direct billing of certain services. So for example, if you have a student that requires an, a, a paraprofessional, a lot of times the service of the paraprofessional is just a direct bill back to the district. Um, and those are funds that need to be raised appropriately. Additionally, manifest educational uh, hardship requests for transfers can happen at any time during the school year. And so uh, it's, there's the potential that there could be quite a burden over the course of the year until a lot of these come up. Um, and then finally, the other piece to, the, to, to talk about with the cost. Um, getting, getting a manifest educational hearing to your school board is, is pretty much all inside of your district. You work with your school board, you work with the parents, with the teachers and with the students. Once you move to um, an appeal at the state board, that's when attorneys get involved. And so there's an additional cost that comes along with um, taking that, uh, those cases to the state board as well. Um, but I think my biggest message is, is that the system works. The system works really well the way it is now. Um, it enables us to get valuable feedback from our, from our constituents, from our families, from our parents, and from our kids. Um, to make better decisions for everyone in our district. So I hope um, that you will feel the same way and vote that this bill is an expedient to legislate. I'm happy to take any questions. Okay. Okay. Would, would this description be correct in terms of how the process goes that indeed in most cases it's, it's, it's a situation where we're dealing with conflict resolution? Um, with the man the ones that I've seen for manifest educational hardship, they've all been conflicts of some type, yes. It hasn't been related to the provision of educational services in the instances that I have dealt with. Thank you so much. My name, for the record, is Michelle LaBelle. I'm representing Smith Choice for New Hampshire. Uh, I have two particular things I wanted to bring to the committee's attention. Uh, as Representative Rad mentioned, uh, there were a couple cases recently at the State Board of Ed hearings where manifest educational hardship was discussed in light of their revision of the rules. Uh, I was present at both the November and December meetings and took note of it. It was interesting that at the November hearing, the cases had dragged on for years where the school board had an attorney, the families were trying to deal with this on their own. And it was both cases were about severe bullying things that went unresolved within their districts. At the December State Board of Ed hearing, uh, there were two cases brought to the board's discussion. One was more about the academic fit, both involving AP courses that were not available at their local district and sports programs that this particular child had a talent for. And the other case was, again, severe bullying. In those two cases, the families were looking for transfers within the public school system. In fact, the one that was about bullying asked for a transfer within the same district but it was denied because, as the parent was told by that superintendent, it wasn't convenient for them. It had nothing to do with enrollment capacity. So I think this is very important to consider. Whilst this may work very well for many districts, we're, we are talking about very few and far between, but these are cases where these children need some sort of relief. These are happening. These are, they aren't satisfying the kids. I have. Uh, copies, two copies, and I'll send electronic copies to the entire committee. Uh, that includes uh, the emails that I received, the redacted to remove the sensitive information, uh, written testimony that was supplied to the State Board of Ed at the December meeting, and in the last 16 years, only one case that was brought to the State Board of Ed's attention for address for appeal, only one in 16 years has been found in favor of the family. Only one. Do we have a question? Sure. 
basis of taxes. Certain communities have high taxes in their areas and they go to their annual meetings and they support their schools and other places don't. So there is always an option for a student who wants to move schools. You can move and, and just let's not forget that. I've been dealing with educational, Memphis Educational Hardship and Best Interest and they are two separate things I'll discuss a little bit about for about 12 years. I've been superintendent. Best interest is a superintendent's decision and uh, it has a little bit, and again, neither of these terms are defined well. Best interest or manifest educational hardship, they're not well defined in law. I mean, I, I don't mean to make a joke about this, but how do we define pornography? You know when, when you see it. It's a local decision. If that, you're never going to be able to nail down a definition that's really going to work for everyone across the state. It's going to be different standards in different areas. So best interest is it's a superintendent decision. And, um, you know, oftentimes a parent would come to me and say, look, it's just not my best interest for this child to be here. And the superintendent would sit there and look at the case, say, you know, you're right. And I'm going to call up a fellow superintendent and say, look, can I put this kid in another school? Let me give you an example of that one. We had a student who, uh, I won't say the district name, but he was in love as a sophomore, and uh, his girlfriend broke up with him, and he just couldn't handle it. And he ended up stalking her, he ended up bothering her, he disciplined him, he got him counseling, he did all these sort of things, but he just wasn't going to change. And it wasn't the girl who came and said, will you move my child? It was the boy's parents who said, look, he's just not getting over this girl. We've been through all the discipline process, can you help? The student, everything's fine, called the local superintendent and say, hey, can I make uh, best interest this child over to your district? And in that case, they worked it out. The kid went to school and things worked out fine. Now, the best interest has changed in the end rules where you have to have your school board's permission to do that, but, but that's okay. Manifest educational hardship, a little bit higher um, definition of what that is. You really have to prove, you know, look at the words. Manifest, it has to be obvious. Uh, it's not something that's hidden. And it's a hardship. It has to be a true detriment to the child's schooling. Um, you go to the school board, the, uh, the school board hears the case, not just the superintendent, so it's a little bit more public. And then the, the school board can make that decision, which may involve you know, tuition that, that child out. Um, before that, there's a million things that happen. I can't tell you how many requests I get during the school year. My child doesn't like his teacher. Okay. Let's look at that. Would it be better for your child to stay in that teacher's class because we put him in there for a reason? Or is it really an issue we have to move? My child's being bothered in that class. Should we move the class? I, only have, I don't have multiple schools in my district, so I can't move the kids between schools. But we are dealing with these problems like this all the time, trying to work with parents and trying to, trying to solve them. The biggest issue I had, or the biggest time I used manifest educational hardship and best interest is when Dumbarton changed from SAU 19, which was Goffstown, to Bow. And we had a bunch of children who 
were going to be switching schools. They were in Dunbarton Elementary School, they were going to go to Gosstown Middle School for a year, and then they were going to come to Bowen. And that was a decision that had been made uh, by the communities involved, but there were individual families involved. And so we used the best interest and the manifest educational hardship to look and, and keep about six to seven students in the Goffstown system because it was either in the best interest or a manifest educational hardship. And it's funny, one of the cases that we granted was about sports. This girl was a volleyball player. And, she, and it wasn't just, I like playing volleyball. This girl played the competitive leagues. She had been doing this for years. She not only played on her school team, she played in um, outside and development leagues. She was looking at a Division I scholarship. It was in her best interest to stay in Goffstown. The boards looked at that. They decided that was okay. They granted it. Uh, another case, we had a mother who was dying of cancer, and her extended family was in the Goffstown system. And they came and they made a case to the school board. And the school board said, you know, that's a real valid case. It's better for you <coughs> interest, to stay in that school. I had a number of people. I probably had, I probably heard about 25 <coughs> cases that time. And some of them were more frivolous. It was, my child likes her basketball team. Or, you know, my child wants to take this particular course or that particular course. And we had as a board to sit down and make the decisions and make those little things. The law is not broken. It's been working for a long time, and what I see here is really an effort to make this a school choice law. It was never designed to be a school choice law. It was designed to be a way for administrations and school boards to take care of some pretty unusual circumstances for kids who are really having uh, issues in school. I don't see that the changes in this law add anything uh, process-wise. And I'll say one more thing and be quiet. I promise to try to keep it low. The appeal process is difficult now, because bef before the school board was politicized, before the school board, the state school board was politicized and done by political appointment, when you went up to the state school board and you reviewed a case, they were reviewing procedure, they were reviewing due process, they were reviewing that you as the local board gave a good decision based on the evidence, but they respected your decision as a local board. Recently, that hasn't been the case. Boards have come in, they've had really good decisions that they made at the local level, and the state school board says, for political reasons, we don't agree, we believe that, that you have erred, we're gonna force you as the local board, because they can't tell, they, they have to make a different decision, but to review the case over and over. And it's like, what authority does the state board have to tell the local board that you need to spend local money in a different way? So it's a little bit of a fault, flawed process in the review process. I'll stop there. I'm sorry. <laughs> Once I go to rant. Any questions, anyone? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And we have one last card, Nan Parsons. The New Hampshire Association of School Principals. Good afternoon. Thank you for allowing me to speak. I'm Ian Parsons, and I represent the Hampshire Association of School Principals. We stand in opposition to House Bill 1492. And you've heard a lot of different financial uh, obligations discussed. You've heard some negative stories. But I'd like to, hit, to talk to you about the positive stories, what we're actually doing in school, and give you multiple data points as a parent, as a guardian of an elementary school student, as a former elementary and high school principal, and as a sitting school board member today. So I think it's important that I share a few of the positives, and I'll pick out two that I think are most important. As an elementary principal, I had a student who had an IQ that was off the charts. It was easy to say that we, don't have, we have no obligations to this child because we are needing an adequate education. But the parents talked about a manifest educational hardship at that point. So instead of saying that that child really needed to present a case, we all knew we needed to provide support for this child. So we brought the child, the family, and any, any other experts that we could find to come to the table to make decisions for this child. We talked to uh, the University of Connecticut to create a plan for this child around a gifted program. We allowed him to take courses at the high school and at Dartmouth College. This was all done in a collaborative effort with parents without even having to uh, 
to go with the manifest education hardship. It was in the best interest. And I appreciate that Dean talked about the difference between the two, because they do get blurred. But it is important to know that that's what we're looking at most of the time. That's not often what you're hearing. As a high school principal, I had a student who was facing extreme racial bias. Uh, we were a school who had very few uh, minority students. Parents were very upset. He was very upset. They wanted to leave the school. They wanted us to send him elsewhere. So the conversation I had with the family and the student is, what do you need to be successful here? And how can I support you in being successful? So what did we do? We hired ed equity uh, consultants from Dartmouth College who came in and worked with our faculty and our students. We gave this student voice. We started a student community club. So out of very bad came incredibly good for this student. We did not have to go the manifest educational hardship route. And I think that's really important that you understand that most schools go above and beyond to support their kids in being successful. That's critical. And we know that we work together. That's the key. We already are working together as principals with parents. Sometimes we need to bring in the superintendents and sometimes school boards. But essentially, it's about making the principal and the family, and for me, the child, part of the solution to the problem. This is what's happening in most schools today. And this is why we oppose uh, the amendments to 14, uh, the Amendment 1492. Thank you for taking my question. Do you see a problem with um, the language we've all already pointed out about the uh, level one or two school that shows no academic achievement in both for two consecutive years uh, should be deemed a failing school by the department and not in the best interest of the child as a reason for making this? Um, I do see a problem with that, and it, it's a financial problem for starters that we're taking away from schools already who need support, but why aren't we instead going into those schools and supporting them in a meaningful way? That's what I would like to see happen. Uh, and we can provide for kids. One of the schools that I talked about was a profoundly low-income, low socioeconomic school. We can do this. We can provide supports for kids. Representative Tyler? No, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for being here. I want to express my appreciation for your being here and expressing the principal's voice. That voice has been absent for the last five years since I've been here. I appreciate being here to represent the field. Thank you. All right, thank you for your Thank you very much. I will be brief. I think my comments echo a lot of what this committee has, it has already heard, but mainly, and for the record, my name is Diana Fenton. I'm an attorney with the Department of Education. Um, this bill does blend, appears to blend manifest educational hardship and best interests, as Superintendent Cascaden uh, mentioned previously, and they are separate and distinct from one another. And best interest is addressed in paragraph three, which you will find on page two of your bill. By blending the two, um, and not maintaining that delineation, I think it does confuse some of the standards that are applicable um, in paragraph one regarding manifest educational hardship in paragraph three. Similarly, on page four, uh, we find the definition section. As a practical matter, it always uh, makes good legislative sense to have the definition in the beginning of the statute. Because I assure you, as an attorney who's done this for many years, we never read the whole thing. We <laughs> so, <laughs> the definition. And I'm under oath, I have to tell her. The definition has to be moved. Uh, it, it has to be moved logically. And that's something that people are going to look for. Um, along with Barrett Christina, I, I too did some legislative history into manifest educational hardship. And it was interesting to note, and I'll share with the committee, um, that there was a recognition that these cases are so fact dependent and they're all so different that it was difficult to define manifest educational hardship. And to be frank, I don't know if it can be defined because there has to be a recognition that they are all so different. And parents have a right to say it might not fall within the definition, but it is a manifest educational hardship to my child. Um, so I will just share that with the committee and leave you with the um, 
my technical comments that it is important to separate out manifest educational hardship and best interest. I'm happy to take any questions, but I think the speakers before me were much more eloquent. I can ask a question. I don't think it's a question about me anything. You know I know I will. I'm, I'm really struck by the previous speaker's assertion that the appeals process at the State Board of Education had become political. As the attorney for the Board of Education, is the appeal at the state court level supposed to be like an appellate court where only the process is reviewed and not reversed unless it's a process issue? Or have we shifted now to where the, the appeal at the state board of education is a de novo assessment of the value of the appeal itself and more than just process? So I'm actually not the attorney for the Board of Education. Uh, that is handled by the Attorney General's office. Um, and so they are in a better situation to speak to that. But I can tell you, just having done appellate work, typically the review is not fact-based. You don't want to have another layer of fact-finding. It's more <coughs> procedural. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you for taking my question. In my world, which is mathematical, the definition is that which clearly identifies what is from all things that are not. And when I look at this definition, I don't see that as a good definition. Now, the reason I mention it is I want you to respond to the idea that a single person or two, medical doctor, psychologist, parent, etc., could come in understanding what a manifest hardship is and essentially, by the word shell, set this action in motion for an action. Is, is there any way that that could happen from one person's interpretation? I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but I don't see that as a definition. I, I agree with you, and thank you for the question. I agree with you that the definition needs work. Uh, I, I think that the problem, as I mentioned earlier, what I alluded to was historically in looking at some of the legislative work on this previously, is it's very hard to define. And perhaps can't be defined. But the concern is that we craft a definition <coughs> that then um, prohibits par parents from coming forward and saying, I have a manifest educational hardship. And so that, that would be one of the concerns. So again, in moving forward with this legislation, I just wanted to share that historical piece. Um, as Derek Christina had alluded to previously, that there is just a recognition <coughs> that these cases come in so many different facts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your Thank you. All right, so I will close. Attorney Ernest, do you have testimony, please? Diana, do you not have record testimony? I do not. No, <coughs>